Apologies, she's had a, a little bit of an accident and uh, is limping around and with the snow coming she asked me to pinch hit for her. So uh, my name is Roy Hoagland, I'm a Vice President at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and uh, I'm here to moderate this session on uh, the Great Waters Coalition and learning from our partners elsewhere. As you know, the uh, Choose Clean Water Coalition is about a year old now, I guess. This is its, its second annual uh, conference, and it's worked hard to um, build, a, build a, a unified voice on various issues, and we're attempting to do the same thing um, with all the Great Waters across the United States through the Great Waters Coalition. Um, which is still in its, its, its I'd say, uh, formative years. We're, we're, we're working still on um, membership and some bylaws and priorities. We have, did work on um, the omnibus lands and water bill, for example, that um, did not pass this Congress, but we are moving forward with members. And um, You have several people here, um, organizations that have been the leaders in the Great Waters Coalition, the National Wildlife Foundation, and the National Parks Conservation Association both have been um, the two leads, frankly, um, in the creation of this coalition and moving it forward. So today what we're going to do is we have four panelists who are going to share some of their work um, from other parts of the country. Hopefully you'll be able to glean some new insights or new ideas. Each person's going to go for about 10 minutes. We have enough time for questions and answers. Um, they asked to do their 10-minute presentation first and then open it up as opposed to having questions during the presentation. So please make note of your, of your questions and be sure we have a robust dialogue afterwards. These people know what they're talking about and they're a great resource. So I'm just going to facilitate. I'm going to tell them to shut up at the end of the 10 minutes um, and move forward. So. Our first speaker is going to be uh, Jeff Skelling, who is with um, Healing Our Great, uh, Healing Our Waters, the Great Lakes Coalition. They have been very, very successful in moving things forward, both in terms of funding and um, some pollution reduction. So, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Roy. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to whip through this. We have ten minutes, and I guess we have some time. A significant amount of time afterwards for more question and answer. I'm Jess Skelling, I work for the National Wildlife Federation here in Washington, and uh, I'm the campaign director for the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition, which some of you may be familiar with, and others may not, and I hope that by the end of this presentation you'll know more about us if you don't already. We started about five years ago, I'm going to take you through a sort of a whirlwind tour of the backdrop here of how we got to where we are out there in the Great Lakes. Um, we, our, our effort actually started under President Bush, who issued an executive order five years ago, or six years ago. That basically declared the Great Lakes as a national treasure, and that actually was the impetus to, to start a, um, a movement on a number of fronts to move towards uh, significant investment and in restoration by the U.S. Congress. And um, that executive order actually led to the formation of a governmental task force that was led by EPA, and they subsequently set up this very huge, this very broad, diverse stakeholder process out in the Great Lakes that brought together hundreds and hundreds of people to kind of look at the lakes and see what the problems were. They categorized all the biggest challenges. And they actually came up with a plan in record time. For those of you who are familiar at all with watershed planning, and probably at any scale know that these things can take time and effort and they're very challenging, especially when you have that many people in the room. In the Great Lakes, we managed to do it in about a year's time. So we came up with a, a cleanup strategy in 2000, late 2004-2005 that was essentially still remains the blueprint for uh, all of our activities that we engage in as the Human mm -hmm. Waters Coalition and all of our partners and allies in the Great Lakes. It's been a great organizing vehicle for us. Um, that was the outcome of that stakeholder process. It was really, you know, in a lot of ways, it was kind of a miracle to have that many people sit around the table and believe in what the challenges are and how we should, how we should tackle them. So that really got the ball rolling. Um, and then in the meantime, as all this was going on, uh, the Great Lakes community was kind of organizing around or congealing around the formation of a coalition that became the Healing Our Waters Coalition. And I'm, I'm going to talk, I think my purpose up here actually, my main purpose up here is to kind of share how we did it, the successes that we met with and, and kind of the component pieces that led up to that. And all of it, in my mind, comes around, comes from the coalition effort, the coalition that was built around uh, five years ago called the Healing Our Waters Coalition that led up 
to where we are today. So I'm, in a second, I'll share just the component pieces. But just to finish on kind of the um, sort of snapshot tour of, of along the way here, you know, basically this was, it won't surprise any of you, that the success that we have met with in the Great Lakes is really a combination of hard work and the stars aligning for us. And the big part of the stars aligning for us, of course, was the, uh, President Obama's election and him being from, um, being a Great Lakes Senator and then presidential candidate. In 2008, the coalition focused squarely on the politics of that presidential election and said, let's get the candidates to commit to the Great Lakes. Let's get the candidates to recognize this magnificent resource and get some, put some resources and pledge to put some money behind it, basically, if they are to be elected president. And we got every candidate to do that in one form or another, including President, then Senator Obama, who pledged $5 billion over if he were to be elected in his term of office, he said, I'm going to find $5 million for the Great Lakes. Well, you can imagine how that excited us and uh, how we leveraged that into where we are today. So he also brought along with him a chief of staff named Rahm Emanuel, who stood in front of the Great Lakes Conference in Chicago, much like this conference some years ago, and said, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you the money. And, and actually, what he said then was, I'm going to bring you the money through the Great Waters concept. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to advance this idea that if we all come together in these big, giant ecosystem restoration efforts, we can float everybody's boat. And we can get Congress at the national level to really invest, recognize the, the economic and environmental benefits of, of significant investment in restoration. We're going to do it on a broad scale. And the Great Lakes is going to benefit like everybody else from that. That's what he said to us at, at our conference in Chicago. It was very exciting for us to hear. Um, so that's a little bit of the backdrop of uh, what's happened in the Great Lakes over the last six years. That that's about how long the coalition has been active. And um, so let me talk just for a second about the, the elements of the Healing Our Water, Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition that I think have been a tremendous uh, part of the success out there. And I'll just list off. I'm sorry I don't have a PowerPoint. I just didn't have the time. But actually, I think there's two people up here that can entertain you with pictures in a second. I'm not one of them, but I'll list off, I think, where the component pieces of this coalition, I think, were really integral to our success. First thing, of course, no surprise to anything, anybody, we had funding. We had significant funding to run this coalition. We were, the Great Lakes, as some of you might know, historically has been, um, we've been lucky in that region to have a, a, a long list of funders who care about the Great Lakes and care about environmental issues and have a long history of generous giving. And so we were able to benefit from that. In our case, we had a particular funder who was just a real laser focus on wanting to, who loved the Great Lakes and, want, and, wants, to, and wants to save them, and, and, and helped us to a very generous contribution for a five-year period, and that really got the coalition up and running and the campaign run. And there's some people in the back there, I see Mark Van Putten back there, who's critical of all this, and maybe Mark, if you sidebar, or, or maybe doing the conversation, you can add to, to what I'm saying here. But obviously, funding is so critical, we needed that. Um, the coalition decided first and foremost and early on we were going to focus on one issue, generating fed significant federal funding from Congress to restore the lakes. That's all we were going to do. That's all we were, there's, there's, there's many, many environmental issues in the Great Lakes. We decided that we were going to focus on that. And that, you know, the reality of that and, and is that we ignored some other issues, some tough pollution issues that exist in the Great Lakes just like they do everywhere else. You know, and we've taken heat for that and criticism for that over the years, and still do. But we remain focused, for the most part, on funding for restoration projects, on the ground restoration projects, and address the critical needs in the Great Lakes. And we stuck to our guns on that, and we weren't pulled off the dime on that. And I think that was a critical part of how we got to where we are today. Um, in the Great Lakes, the environmental community has a long history of getting along. Um, I'm not so sure that's true in every other ecosystem out there. You all may have your own experiences in the Chesapeake Bay, but we're fortunate in the Great Lakes, for whatever reason, these groups have a long, long history of environmental advocacy and the ability to talk to each other, to agree to disagree, and come together. And that's how the Healing, you know, the Healing Our Waters Coalition could not exist because, of course, all of those groups and organizations that, are, that we know of out there um, are part of who we are. And they put their differences aside. We have our squabbles. We have our, we have our disagreements, but uh, we tend to get along pretty well. We also made the coalition diverse. We tackled the business, the economic equation, which now I think is becoming incredibly important with the new Congress. We, we, you know, we, we saddled up with some people that we traditionally don't saddle up with in the business community. Council of Great Lakes Industries is a good example of an association that, you know, uh, we don't always agree with on any number of issues, but we do agree that 
the significant federal funding coming into the Great Lakes region to boost the economy and the environment is a good idea. And we can all agree on that. So we have a diverse coalition of some pretty powerful messengers that are outside the traditional environmental conservation community. Along those lines, we commissioned a report with industry in the Brookings Institution, which is not exactly a liberal um, established, a, a liberal organization that uh, cares, you know, that is squarely focused on saving the environment. But they understand that if you invest in restoration, you're investing in the economy. And of course, in the Great Lakes, which has suffered economically for so many years and decades, uh, that's a powerful message to say, you know, we're going to clean up we're gonna the Great Lakes and we're going to you know, boost the economy. And, we're, and the Brookings Institution issued a report that made that connection. It said, you know, you Congress give us, you know, $26 billion, and we'll show you a two-to-one return economically on that investment. Very powerful message. We put a report out. They put a report out that we continue to use uh, today. It has incredible legs because the message is so powerful. Um, the other uh, element of our coalition that's been so successful is we have two people in Washington, D.C., and we have three people in the Great Lakes region. we we'll cover. Okay? The Great Lakes region has never had you know, full-time people on Capitol Hill watching, looking, talking, figuring it all out, pushing pushing the message, bringing people in from the region, guiding them through the, through the, through the Capitol Hill process. It's incredibly effective. I mean, it's, it's a luxury in a way to have two people full-time on a regional campaign like this. Um, we also have, we've also spent a lot of time building a grassroots grass tops field operation out in the Great Lakes. We have staff people out there who are running the coalition. We have we fund our coalition members in each of the Great Lakes states, and we pass through money to them, a very powerful tool, to get them to work at the state level to advance our federal agenda. So the field operation has grown over the years into a real effective political tool, and it's that one-two punch of having the field operation doing grassroots activity out in the region, and we've got the Capitol Hill presence. It's a real nice connection. Works quite well. Uh, we, along with the field program, we also developed a communications program. We, we invested in public opinion surveys and polling. We asked people, you know, how they felt about the issue. And, you know, we use that data to form our messages, our communication messages, um, and in the first five years of the campaign. Very, it was a really good investment. And, we, you know, we got messages like, you know, if we don't do it now, it's going to get more expensive later. Which seems kind of simplistic, but you, in order to get, to, you know, to really be, be sure that those messages are going to work, you have to make some sort of investment in kind of the public opinion world. So we're about to embark upon that again because Congress has so significantly changed, especially in the House of Representatives. We're going to go back into the public opinion survey work and figure out what the new message ought to be to continue going. And then the last thing we do, I'm really I'm sensing I'm out of time here, uh, we, once the federal funding got flowing through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and that was the big victory was for us, was an appropriation last year, fiscal year 2010, $475 million from, from Congress for the Great Lakes, through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, we basically sent money to EPA and other agencies. A big part of that legislation was that it allowed EPA to distribute funding to other agencies that do restoration work in the, in the Great Lakes, like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a right, good example. Um, and, and other agencies that are engaged in restoration. And they put an action plan together, by the way, that they're about to refresh. But the point is, the agencies are, it's a multi-agency effort, and I'm not sure in other ecosystems whether that actually is whether the game plan or congressionally authorized or whatever, but it's very effective to bring people together under one plan. All these agencies and all these programs that address restoration in one way or another in the Great Lakes, it helps them to get, kind of make them more cohesive and easier to implement. And then the, the last thing that we've done with, that I think is important as a coalition effort is simply, you know, we had a lot of responsibility in generating that federal funding, and, and then as a coalition we decided once that money started to flow to the region, which it is now, that we ought to somehow get, get engaged to make sure that money is spent wisely and most effectively. Because the only way that you're going to get more money is to tell Congress it's working back home. And so we are engaging in our own implementation program. We call it our implementation program, but it's essentially a grant program for small watershed groups and other members and allies to help them in whatever way leverage those larger grant awards from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And so we felt that we had to do our part in, in the whole implementation game. And of course, the, the, the loop, the closing of the loop there is we help people, groups, engage in successful restoration projects, and we can point at them. 
and say, look, it worked. We got measurable economic benefits, we have measurable environmental benefits. We come back to Washington, we tell the story to the congressperson, say, you know, and this is a reason why she continued to fund Great Lakes restoration. restoration. So I think those are the key components of the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition. We can have discussion afterwards. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Barmeyer from the National Parks Conservation Association. Association is going to talk about restoring America's ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Um, so as Jeff said, I'm Sarah Barmeyer, the Great Waters Program Manager at National Parks Conservation Association. I'm going to provide an overview of the Everglades and some of the actions that are being taken to restore the Everglades. Um, so these two maps show the watershed of the Everglades. Map A, the far map from where I'm sitting, um, simulates a satellite view of what the Everglades would have looked like 100 years ago. It shows the historic flow flowing south from Lake Okeechobee, and it's a, it's a fairly wide expanse, and sometimes parts were as wide as um, 50 miles across, and it flows south into Florida Bay. Well, in 1947, Congress formed the Central and Southern Florida Flood Control Project, which built 1,400 miles of canals and levees and water control devices in the hopes of draining the Everglades. So map B shows what the Everglades look like today. It's a highly compartmentalized man-made um, system and approximately 50% of the remaining Everglades um, exist today. 1.7 billion gallons of water per day on average are discharged into the ocean and gulf. There's been a 90 to 95% reduction in wading bird populations and 68 um, plants and animals are threatened or endangered. Um, so here's a map of the Everglades now. It's similar to the map B on the previous slide. It shows where the public lands are located, the Everglades agricultural area, and some of the cities that border the area. Um, the area, the shaded area with lines, shows where the remnant Everglades are now. And you can see that the National Park is only um, part of the entire ecosystem. This National Park is actually the third largest park in the U.S. And this is the largest continental wilderness east of the Mississippi River. So there are many threats that plague the system. Um, agriculture, as you saw on the previous side, slide, um, exists just north of the Everglades, so nutrients run off and run south into the Everglades. Their city, the cities there and their urban boundaries continue to put pressure on the boundaries of the Everglades. Um, and this list shows that there's a host of other threats that um, we have to deal with when trying to restore the Everglades. So with that many threats going on, there are also a lot of restoration efforts going on. Um, this list highlights some of the main restoration activities going on. And the Everglades has a similar coalition um, as the Choose Clean Water Coalition and the um, Healing Our Waters Coalition that Jeff described just now. Um, and one of their primary projects that they're focused on is actually this picture, these two pictures. In the far picture, this is Tamiami Trail. This is a road that connects Tampa and Miami. And it's built on land, so it actually runs straight through the Everglades and acts like a dam, preventing water from flowing from north to south. And so one of the main projects that the coalition is working on is trying to get this road elevated. And the Department of the Interior, well, well let me back up. There's construction going on right now on one mile of it. And the Department of the Interior has just, um, I guess, endorsed an EIS that uh, recommends five and a half more miles. So out of an 11 mile segment, um, six and a half miles should hopefully be bridged if we can find the funding for that. Um, so the primary framework for Everglades um, restoration is in a plan that's called the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. It's considered the world's largest ecosystem restoration project, and SERP, as it's commonly referred to, provides a framework to restore, protect, and preserve the water resources of Central and South Florida. It covers 16 counties over an 18,000 square mile area, and centers on an update of, the, of the, the older plan, the Central and Southern Florida Project. It's a federal and state partnership with the state of Florida, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Department of the Interior as some of the major players. And this differs from the Chesapeake Bay in that um, EPA is not one of the major players. Um, the plan was approved in the Water Resources Development Act of 2000, 
and includes more than 60 different elements. And it will ensure, once it's completed, it ensures proper qu uh, quantity, quality, timing, and distribution of water to the Everglades and southern Florida. Um, so the goal of SERP is to capture this water that's being discharged to the ocean and gulf and redirect it to the areas that need it most. Um, some of the pros and cons of this plan. Um, some of the pros is a federal and state partnership which has worked pretty well and unlike Chesapeake Bay we're only dealing with one state in Florida. Um, it, ha it has adaptive management built into the process. It's comprehensive in that it looks at the entire ecosystem and it's codified so it's, it's law. Um, some of the cons, there's no dedicated source of funding so it's subject to appropriations which um, dedicated funding is something that the Great Waters Coalition was looking at on a national level. Um, it's a long process. It, it's, it's expected to take about 30 years to construct, and working with the Corps is also a very time-consuming process. Um, it's expensive. The initial projections are around um, $7.8 billion, and it's vulnerable to political shifts because of appropriations and authorizations. So these diagrams show um, the historic, the current, and the future flows. The historic flow is similar to the initial, that map A that I showed with the wide flow coming down. The current flow just shows how water is sort of going everywhere and not really originally to where it was intended to go. And so the plan, once completed, we're hoping that the flow looks more like this last um, diagram right here. Um, and if you attended the, the opening lunch yesterday, and as Jeff mentioned just now about the Brookings Institution um, report about the Great Lakes, you can understand the economic message is so important to press right now. Um, well, the Everglades Foundation commissioned an economic study that was released late last year that found that for every one dollar invested in Everglades restoration, it generates four dollars in economic returns. Um, and some of the benefits that are felt are in sectors such as drinking water supply, real estate, park visitation, tourism, fishing, hunting, um, wildlife habitat. And it also found that these restoration park, uh, projects will have an incremental impact on employment of about 442,000 jobs in the next 50 years. And this is a message that we've been using on the Hill since this report came out. And um, we've had briefings with Hill staff and with administration officials, and it's resonating well, and it's a message that will continue to plug in the coming years. And um, one final issue in Florida that I want to mention is the numeric nutrient standards. Um, this issue goes beyond the boundaries of Everglades, and it, it, it will affect the entire state. So conservation has sued EPA because the narrative nutrient standards, which is like the fishable, swimmable, drinkable standards, um, those were protecting water quality. Um, the, this picture shows a tributary of the St. John's River, and the St. John's River has been recently nicknamed the Green Monster. And this toxic, these toxic algal blooms are recurring throughout Florida due to phosphorus and nitrogen from fertilizer, manure, um, sewage. So EPA, under consent decree, is now establishing numeric nutrient standards, so the amount of chemicals that are in the water can be regulated more effectively. Um, the final freshwater rule is out now for review, and then there will be another um, another set of standards for coastal waters that will be out later next year. This is highly controversial. The ag community and the business community don't like this at all. They actually took out an ad in a newspaper that had an obituary for Florida's economy, um, and now the state is suing EPA. So. Um, who knows what will happen with this, but if the standards do take effect, it will have a positive effect on the Everglades because water quality and the water coming into the Everglades is so critical to the restoration of the Everglades. So this is a big issue that, um, that may have national implications, so it's something that I think will be of interest for everyone to keep an eye on. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Okay. Good. Can everyone hear me without, without the microphone, or do I need the microphone? <laughs> so there's, there's more than just the people in the room. Okay. Um, well, I'm Brian Moore. I work for the Audubon Society here in D.C. And uh, as, as I look around, I see people I know, but I do see 
one Audubon member from Northern Virginia, Glenn Booth, it's nice to see you, Glenda. Did not know you were interested in Long Island Sound. But, uh, <laughs> you're interested in everything. Well, the Long Island Sound, I don't know what people do know and do not know about it, but it's a, it's a pretty important waterway for our nation. It exists um, between Long Island and Connecticut, and then it moves further north, the watershed, towards Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and, and Vermont. Um, it's, it's, it's vital economically for that region, meaning it's probably the waterway in our nation with the largest population around it. Lots of shipping, lots of industry using um, the sound and, and the tributaries to it. Um, and it's been largely um, ignored, um, at least in the sense of its importance to our nation and the health of the water there, meaning for about 15 years, there's been uh, two programs through the EPA, the Long Island Sound, Sound Stewardship Program, along the Sound Restoration Program. Um, and they're essentially the same program, funded through one Appropriations Act, and headed up by one office in Stanford, Connecticut. This office um, is, until last year, was funded at about four and a half to five million dollars a year. So, all the federal government's efforts to restore the Long Island Sound, four million bucks a year. You know, that's like a baseball player salary, right? So it's it's a, it's it's been um, something that we've identified for a long time and, and have wanted to increase um, its notoriety and make sure folks know how important it is, uh, especially Congress. And so over the last two or three years, we've we've doubled that appropriations uh, to just a little bit over. $7 million a year to this Long Island Sound office, which is, I think, half of what the Nationals are now playing, paying their right fielder. So we're, you know, we're getting there. Um, we're almost like a really good major league player in the Long Island Sound. Um, but um, we're running into uh, a new era on that, whereas the, the current programs we have up there are expiring. Um, there's been an effort last year, along with all the water bills and lands bills to reauthorize these two programs. Um, and we really thought the best way was to combine them into one program because that's the way the EPA was treating them to begin with. And we ran into to many problems, uh, or I wouldn't call them problems, many uh, um, things to think about. The original programs only dealt with Connecticut and New York. Those are really the primary states that use this waterway, but it's not the whole watershed. So, as you ex work on reauthorizing this program, it would be ideal to expand it to all the states that, uh, that, that, that the watershed is included in. Um, but, you also run up against a money problem. As you guys all know, there's a deficit, it's getting bigger, the Congress is likely to cut spending over the next several months for existing government programs and, and, and defund or uh, have limited funding for future program. So as you try to expand a program, which is really the right thing to do for this because it's, if you make the watershed healthy, you make the body of water healthy as well, where is the money coming from, especially since this is something that's historically underfunded? So we struggled greatly um, in the last Congress on how to write this legislation, and we ended up um, working well with, with both the House and the Senate and, and, and coming together with a bill they got out of committees, but uh, like everything else, never passed, that uh, expanded the program, expanded the, the financial authorization, not meaning it gets more money, but meaning that it could get more money if more money was available. Um, and so that, that was an important step for us to identify that this is just bigger than a two-state issue. And, and, and I, I think that, that that's stuck, and I think that as we move forward this year and, and through this Congress, that will be part of any moving legislation on that. It will be a bigger program, um, at least in its authorization, hopefully uh, financially through its appropriations as well. Um, another issue with the Long Island Sound is, is it's very locally driven. Um, there is the one EPA office there, but both New York and Connecticut have what are called Citizens Advisory Councils, um, CICs, and 
what the, those councils do is they, they look at restoration projects, clean uh, water facilities or, 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 uh, or, or, or water treatment facilities and vote and prioritize on what projects deserve some of the small amount of money, the seven million dollars annually, to improve them. And so it's really a locally driven process. Folks like me in DC, uh, we're removed from that process to a degree. We really only do a few things, try to improve the underlying legislation and try to get more money um, for the program. And so as you expand the program, then it comes to the questions of, well, you have New York and Connecticut, which, by the way, both have new governors, which we now have to re-educate and get going. But you include the other states that may not use the waterway as much, but are clearly part of the watershed. And so these are all things we're struggling with right now. And I think over the next few months, we will have new legislation introduced, both in the House and the Senate. Um, and and, and, and uh, there's a handful of champions. All the all, all all the folks within the watershed are all supportive of this. It's a bipartisan issue, both in the House and the Senate. And we couldn't have a better group of folks helping us in Congress on this. Um, it's just a straight out competition for money, and, and that's what the Great Lakes are working on. Everglades, everyone. You know, we all uh, there's a limited amount of money for these things, and there's a limited, limited amount of government money. Period. So you really have to have a compelling case to get more. Um, so that's what my role here in D.C. is. The local folks' role is to identify pro projects and, and smaller programs that can maybe do cost, cost share things there. Um, currently, uh, in, in part of the, the new authorizations and uh, some of the things we're working on locally is uh, new agreements on TMDL, which I know a lot of folks are Chesapeake Bay folks here, so you, you're very familiar with total maximum daily loads. And, and really, I guess, ultimately, what the goal up there is to continue to work with the EPA and ensure that the EPA have, will continue to have the authority to uh, enforce the TMDLs, but also ensure that uh, there's con continued state funding, and you know, the states also have to chip over this, so state funding levels for uh, clean water uh, enforcement as well. So there's a handful of challenges. Our authorization has expired. We need to reauthorize. As we reauthorize, we need to expand. As we expand, we need to educate the new, the elected officials at the state level and the national level, and the people um, from the new states that we've identified as being part of the watershed. Uh, and so um, our challenges are, are many, but I think really our biggest challenge is talking to people like you and identifying this as a national issue. Everglades is iconic. Great Lakes hits nine states? Eight. Eight? Ah, oh, so close. And Canada. And Canada. Canada's like another state. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, but, but everyone has heard about these things. You know the statistics that the Great Lakes is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, nearly all of our fresh water in the lower 48. You know how important the Everglades is. You know about the loss of land at close to Louisiana. You know about the health of the upper Mississippi River. All these things people have, have known about for a long time and heard about. But the Long Island Sound seems to not make it to that, that higher list of um, uh, uh, of things that the general public recognizes, and that's really um, the bigger part of this goal. The other things will fall in line if, in fact, we can convince the general public that this is as important as every other place, and uh, I, I believe it is, and so that's why we continue to work on it. Um, so I think with uh, every you guys just you know raising your hand and agreeing that Long Island Sound is equally as important as everything else, um, that would probably be it for me. <laughs> we'll let Malia talk about all the great waters. Thank you. My name is uh, Malia Hale. I'm Director for National Restoration and Water Resource Campaigns uh, with the National Wildlife Federation. Uh, let's see. So what I wanted to talk to you today is about the Great Waters uh, Coalition. Last year at this conference, um, Teresa Pierno came up and was able to talk to folks at lunch and talk about the Great Waters Coalition, which had just launched in December um, of 2009, and talk about it was new, it was fresh, and as Roya said, you know, we're now going through growing and building and 
making the coalition a real thing. So currently we have 59 member organizations that are part of the Great Waters Coalition. We also have 10 national Great Water areas and we have and growing in there because we will have additional Great Waters that um, will be added to the coalition. Um, we're going to have a release and the individual water bodies don't know about it yet so or don't know if they've been accepted so we're waiting to do it all at one time so that should be in the next um, couple weeks that we will be revealing the, re the other growing waters and as you can see there the vision is um, a day when America embraces its great waters and ensures they are healthy valued and productive resources for our nation and underneath that are our more tangible goals and that is secure sustainable long-term funding galvanize public support, enact and ensure sound implementation of projects, and provide a forum for information and resource sharing. So when you look at the first one um, in this Congress and, you know, the kind of a climate we are in this economy, this is definitely a long-term goal. But as Jeff um, highlighted, there are members of Congress and senators out there who are interested in this concept of, you know, these waters, in order for them to truly be successful, instead of the, you know, year-to-year -year appropriation spike process to try and get, you know, our little piece of the pie, you know, there should be a larger, broader discussion and um, thoughtfulness in terms of tr providing regular, sustained, dedicated funding to ensure that all of these restoration programs in the Chesapeake, you know, is right in there, you know, receive the funding on a regular basis so you can plan out restoration projects, so you can plan out these areas, you know, years in advance when you know the kind of funding that you're going to get. Um, <clears throat> So here's a map um, to give you an idea of the current ones, and as I said, there will be some more that are along the coast and in the interior that will be added um, to the coalition. And as you can see, we've tried to um, include watersheds, and if you look at the Mississippi, that's one big watershed, so the whole United States in the middle would be orange, so we have that just outlined for folks so they can see that. So, um, you know, how does the how does the Great Waters Coalition help, you know, folks who are Chesapeake Bay advocates? One area that um, I think we were very successful, and while we didn't get across the finish line, I think it was a very successful example on how the Great Waters Coalition can help um, specifically the Chesapeake Bay and Chesapeake Bay folks. And that was this omnibus funding legislation that occurred last year. So it started out where Senator Cardin was bound and determined to move um, the Chesapeake Bay um, legislation through the Senate. And what came up during that deliberation where there were a bunch of other programs, a bunch of other Great Waters programs, the Great Lakes was included in that, Long Island Sound, um, San Francisco Bay, Puget Sound, all of these different areas were all included. They all needed authorizations. So instead of just saying, let's move these individually, you know, there was a discussion and Senator Cardin led the efforts to say, why don't we move these together? Um, you know, it will bring in more interested parties, we'll, get, we'll garner more support, you know, it will help us in moving this legislation forward. So the bills themselves were passed individually out of committee, but they were moved together. And what happened was there was a big effort towards the end of the Congress to try and take all of these bills, package them together, and get them across the finish line. And as that discussion happened, you had other committees looking at it and saying, well, we have a bunch of bills that are like that as well. And so instead of it just being, you know, what we'd like to think of as a Great Waters package, it became, you know, lands package, wildlife bills were in there, and there were some ocean pieces in addition to the waters packages that included the Chesapeake Bay. And as we were moving forward and getting very close, I mean, we really made a good run and got really close with the Chesapeake Bay Bill. Um, as we were getting there, one of the things that happened was there were a lot of senators saying, oh, slow this down. We're not going to let this go if the Chesapeake Bill's in there. You know, the farm bill got involved, all of these individuals, you know, there's too much going on there. That's, you know, questionable. That will have national implications in terms of water quality and what's required around the United States in future efforts if the Chesapeake Bill comes into law. 
But the thing that helped the Chesapeake Bill and why it wasn't stripped out was because you had this unity, you had these group of people working together to make this, you know, to push this forward. So, you know, while we were inches, just inches from getting it through the Senate, um, you know, Senator, the Majority Leader Senator Reid had noticed it, he had it ready to go, he had the package sitting there, you know, if there was time to get it through. While we were just that close, you know, the reason why the, the Chesapeake bill hadn't fallen out was through the efforts of Senator Cardin and through the efforts of making this a larger bill and not just trying to get the Chesapeake through on its own. And so you had people from across the country writing in about this legislation. You had people from across the country pushing what was first Great Waters legislation and then this larger lands, wildlife, um, omnibus legislation, you know, saying we want to get this done. And, you know, the effort that um, was put into that and just how far it reached, you know, it really benefited the Chesapeake Bay. So I just want to kind of throw that out there when people think, well, how does this help us? You know, it really, we were so close and it really helped move the ball forward and really move and, you know, get Congress thinking in this way of, yeah, we should be moving these water bills together and we should think about it that way. We should be banding together and working together. So while we didn't cross the finish line, you know, I think a lot of important blocks were placed, building blocks were placed place for future legislation. So in the current Congress, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to give people an idea of what we're facing. Um, you have 93 new House members. I mean, that is a lot of education that's going to be going on. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who are not going to be familiar with what we're doing, you know, what we're doing in the Chesapeake, the years of investment. This is not just, you know, some restoration project. This is a long-term program, and this is the health of this area, of a large watershed. And they may not understand, you know, a lot, I put the Tea Party members up there because a lot of them are coming into the Congress saying we have a huge deficit, you know, why are we going to have, we want limited federal government. We don't want them involved, you know, we want to scale back on that. And, you know, for those of us who work in these great waters, the federal government has a responsibility to help right the wrongs that have been done to these watersheds. And we need to make that case and we need to help educate these individuals so that um, we can continue to be successful. And it's going to be, it's going to be a battle. And for us working together and through a coalition, we can help. We can help the Chesapeake's efforts. We can help Ryan's efforts in Long Island Sound. We can help the Everglades efforts so that we are working together and we are thinking about things together. Um, one of the key areas, you know, that the Republicans have already talked about, especially in the House, is oversight of the administration and specifically the EPA. You have the Chesapeake Bay and you have this TMDL coming in. You know, the efforts are needed in terms of the WIPs and the implementation, and I've heard a lot about the WIPs Part 2 and all of that, but you're also going to need to support you know, and go to battle for the EPA so that they can do what they need to do with this TMDL. We're seeing that in the Everglades, you know, with the numeric nutrient standards. We're seeing it in Long Island, we'll be seeing it in Long Island Sound. We'll be seeing it in these areas, and the coalition can be a forum for us to marshal our efforts, to share information about how we're, you know, what we're doing to support the EPA on, you know, what they need to do to make sure that our water quality is great. And then you have the appropriations battle. You have, um, you know, there are discussions about a rescission bill coming where they would take balances that have not been expended already by the federal government and, and take that money back. And then you have a continuing resolution coming up in March that ends and the need to discuss where will appropriations go to the end of the year. How will the federal government, how will the EPA be funded? And then you have the normal appropriations process on top of that in terms of future funding. And so all of these areas, you know, the coalition, you know, we should be working together and the coalition can provide a forum to help us do that. 
um, you know, an attack on Chesapeake funding or an attack on the Everglades funding is an attack on all of us. An attack on the TMDL in the Chesapeake is an attack on the numeric nutrient standards in the Everglades. And these are the areas that I think the coalition can be helpful to the Chesapeake Bay. And then you can, you know, assist too with, you know, these other areas so that we do provide a united front and we are stronger um, and show ourselves as a stronger entity. The last thing I'll talk about is just the information sharing. Um, you know, there, you've gotten a lot of information here. Um, you know, one, area, one thing that Jeff mentioned was this concept that the Great Lakes have where they receive, the EPA receives all the funding and then they delegate it out to the other federal agencies. Is that something that other areas and other water bodies want to try and replicate or think about? Is that a better forum? You know, because you can, you can have a lot of accountability with how much money you're actually getting. You know, you don't have to do the crazy, how much money are we really getting here, trying to look at all the different programs, you know, as you do that. But at the same time, it's a big, you know, amount of money. I mean, these are the things that we can discuss that the coalition can discuss if it makes sense for the different areas. And then, you know, in terms of strategy, and, you know, Jeff talked about some of the areas that the Howe Coalition has been successful. Well, when I was down in the Everglades Conference last week, they talked about, you know, there some of the restoration that's going on are creating these big areas. They're, they're they're there to improve the water, and they're called SDAs. And they have become this huge duck hunting habitat where there wasn't duck hunting. It's not just improving duck hunting habitat. It's new duck hunting habitat. And so they're learning. They want to know ways, you know, you, know, you have, um, <coughs> you have um, coastal Louisiana. You have the Great Lakes. You have the Chesapeake, where these are already duck hunting areas. And how do you all you know, work with the hunters and how do you all, you know, use that to your advantage in getting, you know, Congress or to consider your issue. And so these are things that they want to know and this is the information sharing that we think the coalition can provide a forum for. And, you know, I think one thing that's come up that we've seen is the Everglades um, has an economics report, you know, that can show the 4 to 1 investment. You have the Great Lakes that's really, you know, ha has their 2 to 1 investment. And, you know, does, is it time for the Chesapeake to have one? Coastal Louisiana is thinking about one. You know, these are the things that, in terms of information sharing, that we think might be helpful as we continue to all work together and find ways and tactics and activities that we can all push forward together. So, um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that in terms of um, kind of some of, the, some of the higher level issues that are coming up, and if folks have questions, we can delve further into it. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you sharing your expertise. What questions do we have from folks in the audience? Yeah. Towards Jeff, if you would, you talked about a significant private investment. How much of your initial operating costs, your initial efforts, came out of the private sector as opposed to the public sector? You're referring to the operating funds for the coalition and the campaign? Right. Yeah, it was, it was, for the first five years, it was 100% funded by private foundations. And now we're divert, we're actually starting to, you know, that world's changing for us. And we're, we're we, you know, as, as these things go, uh, funding is not always static year in and year out, and you have to kind of look around. So that... Um, that has changed for us in the last year. We've had to diversify that, but primarily it's still coming from the foundations. And as I said in my presentation, the Great Lakes <coughs> is fortunate to have a suite of foundations that care a lot about the Great Lakes and understand the importance of this kind of work. So that that's kind of where we, so our portfolio has kind of diversified in the last year, um, different than the first five years. And we are also now looking for alternative fundraising. <coughs> 
mechanisms, which everybody has to do all the time. For those of you who work in nonprofit environmental work, I think you get that. And so um, we're now branching out a little bit, um, maybe towards some privatized funding sources, but also toward, also generating fund, fundraising through our event, sort of event fundraising. So that's starting to become a larger part of our piece of the pie here. Legislation been re resubmitted for the next Congress, and what's the strategy in terms of uh, how that's going to take place? Malia, do you want to take that question? <laughs> I believe that all the watersheds will be, you know, looking to have their legislation introduced again. Um, I'm not. I mean, I, you'd have to talk to the Chesapeake folks in terms of how big of a priority it's going to be for the coalition to move it, and I think that's where the, um, you know, how 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 far it goes will come up. But I think that they will be introduced. There is a goal to continue to work and put these back together, and hopefully at least try to make some efforts in the Senate. I mean, we're really in an unknown position in terms of where the house is and where we might go in the house because of the change in leadership over there. So it does complicate the issue in terms of getting legislation actually to the president. And I'll just add to that, the, speaking mostly from a Great Lake, there's a Great Lakes bill on that package too. And so I think one thing we have to keep an eye on here is not just thinking about the reintroduction of that package, but thinking about what the component pieces might look like given the new conference. So we might think about our Great Lakes bill in a different way than we did in the version we saw last year. I know that Senator Cardin has already begun looking at what strategy he will use um, in the next Congress and whether or not the bill will get introduced um, in a similar form, whether it will be parceled out and attached to other pieces of of legislation and the question is what is what is the strategy that we move forward. So I know Kristen that there are very um, key discussions on looking at what we will do in the next session. That's right. Uh, Ted Katin with Bluing Environmental. Um, I just wondered if uh, because of the scope and size of some of these projects, if anybody's looked at capital improvement bonds to fund some of these things. You know, uh, we've got some projects that we're looking at up in the Baltimore area that are so large that they uh, qualify for capital improvement uh, bond initiatives and, and different funding sources. And I'm, I'm just wondering if anybody has had any experience with that. Um, nobody wants to take the capital. Uh, I, I do know that at the state level there have been bonds floated, for example, for land acquisition um, in, in Maryland and Virginia. Um, there have been bonds floated for sewage treatment plant upgrades um, at the state level, but I'm not aware of any at the federal level. Are you Malia or Jeff? It would have to happen at the state level, it's yeah. not necessarily something that... Right. The Everglades had some bonds on the state level at so one point. Mostly yeah. at the state level. Um, on the one hand, bundling the legislation makes so much sense. There's something in it for everyone, no matter what area they represent. But is there a concern that as you bundle the costs of all the bills together, it becomes such an astronomical number that, especially now, some of our new members of Congress will just blanch at us? I'll say yes and turn it over to Malia. <laughs> <laughs> then what do we do about that? Yeah, I think that's where the strategy is going to come for this next, I mean, the Great Lakes, how much was yours? 475. The total authorization? Uh, appropriation. No, that was just the appropriation, the 475. Oh, yeah, it was in the billions. Right, right. And so yeah. they are discussing whether they break it down to make it a little, you know, become a little more manageable. And I think that would probably be the discussion that's had with many of these bills. Um, moving forward because of that, because of the new Congress. So I think you're right that that will probably happen. And that just emphasizes the, the I, in my opinion, the need to continue to hammer away at making the economic connection about restoration. Right. You can't just, you can't, you can't, if, if, if we call this thing, it's just, you know, 
we're going to spend a lot of money to improve the water. Everybody in this room thinks that's a great idea, but the people who make decisions need to be more persuaded along the lines of what that does for the economy. Just I, I added that we know that discretionary funding, domestic discretionary funding, is going to be cut and reduced. And the question, part of the question is whether we're going to be able to fight for our piece. Someone else will have to pay. Mark. Thank you. Uh, Mark Van Putten, Conservation Strategy. I wanted to follow up on the first question about the funding for your coalitions. And as you create waters as well as the regional coalitions, one element that's been successful, and Jeff mentioned the private funding in that case, Weggie Foundation, but 20% of it is $5 million, but a million dollars of it was Peter Weggie's personal money. So while it's private money, it was designed to allow lobbying to happen. I know Paul Tudor Jones putting personal money in the Everglades in addition to foundations. So given the constraints that come, particularly with foundation funding, as you look forward with your coalitions, are there major donor outreach programs or you know, ways in which to enhance uh, raising funds that can be used explicitly for lobbying to complement foundation money? And if you want to comment on the political side, you know, fundraising related to these, uh, I guess you probably can't do that in this room. But so, okay, you can comment on that. <laughs> Free legal advice, you can comment. We just can't participate in partisan electoral politics. Right? <laughs> Anybody want to? address Mark's question? Well, I think we're always, uh, you, know, you know, as 